Good afternoon. Well, it's great to see so many of you here in person at TCT. Um, this is going to be an exciting luncheon symposium. You've got fabulous speakers, a really different genre of technology, and we hope that it's going to be both informative, but also will allow for some dialogue. Because when you see something that's new and different, I think that it needs to be constructively challenged and understood, and that's what we're hoping for, to better understand as we attempt to try to expand and generalize the use of different ways to make angioplasty more scientific. And that's one of my main themes for this session. So this satellite is entitled The Cathworks FFR Angio System, A New Era in Coronary Physiology. Um, and we're gonna have four speakers, four talks, time for discussion, and it's gonna run the full gamut. Um, I'm really privileged to have, I think of him as my co-moderator because he's such a close friend, Rand Karnowski, who really was the architect, the inventor, uh, and the genius behind the concept of doing FFR angio. Now, about a decade ago, I think it was, Rand. Um, we have two other great speakers that represent a current generation of high-volume practicing physicians who are the ones that are gonna to need to integrate this into their cath lab milieu, and that's Raul Sharma and Amir Khaki. Interesting topics, so hopefully we can engage in a good discussion, and I'm gonna kick things off by talking about pretty much everything other than FFR angio. So this talk is entitled, The Need for Physiology and a Long Tradition of Disruptive Technologies. And fortunately or unfortunately, I've been around for long enough where I have seen some disruptive technologies, many that have been constructive, others that have been destructive. These are my conflicts. And this is me at the age of six. Um, that was, um, I was carrying a baseball bat. It was my passion at that time. Um, I evolved somehow into this, and it was largely because I didn't have either the ability um, or the sustained interest to play center field for the New York Yankees. But the reality is I've had the opportunity over the course of my career to wear many hats, and it's helped me to gain some perspective about new technologies and how to integrate them into clinical practice. So I've been a clinical practitioner. I've done over 10,000 PCIs over an extended period. I've worked in academics and clinical research. It's an area that I feel very strongly about. And I've had the taste of, I'm not quite an Israeli, I wish I was an Israeli, but um, I've, I've been a bit of an entrepreneur and I've been involved in device development at many levels. Uh, so I've learned many lessons and I'll share some of those with you. I wanna begin by saying if we talk about any disruptive technology, we have to talk about some of the charismatic people who really began this field. And Andreas Grunzig deserves credit. You should be aware that yesterday was the 45th anniversary of the first PCI. Pretty striking. A very charismatic individual who is both a scientist and a great technical interventionalist and a great educator as well. So that was the first disruptive technology. And over the course of the past four decades, we really have evolved into what I call modern era PCI. From the balloon, what Don Bain, one of my closest friends, called plain old balloon angioplasty, POBA, to bare metal stents and drug eluting stents. And then we layered in, importantly, evidence-based validation, always getting to the point that I had hoped for, which was a more scientific PCI in the modern era, which I still believe is the holy grail. So what are the current essential components of interventional cardiology? We began by focusing in the early days on devices and doing procedures. We were, I think, to a certain extent, a little bit more technically inclined and more proceduralist. Now we think a little differently. In the modern era, you have to think about therapies and range of therapies, and you've gotta go back to your roots as a clinician to understand how to apply them. So when we consider the essential components of modern era interventional cardiology, you've gotta be thoughtful and reasonable in terms of clinical indications. You've gotta have command of advanced PCI skills, the application of adjunctive pharmacotherapy to support PCI, 
the judicious use of non-invasive and intravascular imaging and physiology, which we'll get to, the appropriate use of the interventional device toolbox, including mechanical circulatory support, a commitment to evidence-based validation of these new devices and therapies, and complex cardiovascular disease management requires what we now call a heart team, which means we have to have many people who commingle and work together and communicate to achieve the best results. And then I would say that complex cases often require complex decisions, which mandates a respect for social circumstances. And by that I mean there are unmet clinical needs, we always have to adhere to high ethical standards, we've got to be sensitive to patient preferences and make a commitment to shared decision making. That's what we all should be doing. I would also say that as we go back and look over the past four decades, there has been a constant tension between invasiveness, usually interpreted as surgery, versus transcatheter less invasive, and efficacy safety. And is there an acceptable compromise? I showed this slide 20 years ago at TCT. It was my efficacy invasiveness slide, and it had to do with coronary intervention. So balloon angioplasty was not very efficacious, but it was not very invasive in the context of things. Obviously, conventional cabbage was at that time more efficacious, but the most invasive. But the pot of gold was when we hit drug-eluting stents that allowed us to have less invasiveness and approach the efficacy of conventional cabbage. There's also a constant tension between simplicity, what the French call KISS, which is keep it simple, stupid, and complexity, advanced technology and complex procedures. And let's look at coronary stents. This is the original Palmas Schatz bare metal stent. 15 milligrams of 316 L stainless steel on a balloon that was difficult to deliver, to say the least. But it was a simple solution. We took that into clinical trials, the first RCTs really ever done in interventional cardiology. Benestent, as shown here by my friend and colleague Patrick Sarais, showing angiography, clinical outcomes, and then stress. Now, these studies are 30 years old. But this provided the evidence-based validation to suggest that that simple technique made a difference. That elicited what we call the era of stent frenzy, where the application of stents rose to greater than 90% in the United States in a fairly short period of time. But at the same time, we recognized that this was not perfect and that there was good, bad, and what was truly ugly was diffuse instant restenosis, the biologic process that needed to be aborted. So we worked to develop uh, a biotechnology platform, drug-eluting stents, the first two cipher and taxes shown here, clearly demonstrating that we could now develop not just a scaffold, but an active biologic scaffold that could abort adverse healing responses. And this is the first case that Eduardo Sosa did in a diabetic in a mid-LAD with four and 10 years follow-up. So that's pretty impressive. So everybody was screaming that we had cured restenosis until we began to see some of the warts of DES. And one of them was this report of late DES thrombosis that came out of Washington published in The Lancet of four cases of very late stent thrombosis after cessation of antiplatelet therapy. So there also was the good, the bad, and the ugly of drug-eluting stents. Certainly delayed healing, excessive inflammation, late stent thrombosis, abnormal vasomotion, all kinds of interesting issues that we had to deal with. This reached a peak in 2006 at the ESC, Eduardo Kamenzine proudly announcing that drug-eluting stents increase mortality. Now that was an incomplete diagnosis of incomplete data sets that was never published, but within a week Forbes magazine said that DES constituted a million ticking time bombs and I began getting calls about how to remove DES from my patients. So this is part of what we live with in a very visible environment with active social media. DES penetration rates went down from the 90s to 60% in a period of six months. So how did things change? 
Well, I think the successful evolution of PCI still has been this delicate integration of clinical imperatives, new technology, and evidence-based validation. And fortunately, we had been collecting data all along, a lot of data all along. This was published by my colleague Ajay Kirtane in 2009, which was what we called a mega meta-analysis, doing the ultimate comparison of drug eluding and bare metal stents, demonstrating no, mortality was not increased. In fact, it was decreased. And now we, we're talking about, a, about 170,000 patients. MIs were decreased. And target vessel revascularization was decreased by 50%. So we learned some lessons, certainly the power of clinical evidence. We learned also the reliance on appropriate adjunctive pharmacotherapy and the need for second generation devices. But these are some of the lessons that we learn along the way with disruptive technologies. Clearly, evidence-based medicine isn't perfect, and if the data is not interpreted in a balanced fashion, it can create more confusion than clarification. There are other factors that need to be considered to optimize clinical decision-making for interventional procedures. It's not just the data from a clinical trial. And we're entering a phase now in which medicine is being driven by artificial intelligence, deep learning, big data, and the future of clinical research has to endorse modernization with novel, in fact, maybe even radical approaches to accelerate the assessment of new therapies without adding costs and administrative burdens. So this goal that I alluded to in the beginning, that scientific PCI in the modern era, the holy grail, is this achievable? Well, we've always felt if it was achievable, it was because either intravascular imaging or physiology was going to guide the operator. So first came the images, and we tried to improve those images, and they were largely IVIS-based over a period of time. We learned a lot, but certainly IVIS was never accepted as the solitary procedure that would allow you to make angioplasty fully scientific, unfortunately. These are more images showing things you learn with IVIS that really affect you uh, as an operator. This is a study that we did showing the frequency of, of reference vessel disease in angiographically normal or normal looking coronary arteries. Then we made the images better with things like OCT. And OCT shows us a lot. We learn a lot about we're now obsessed with calcific nodules. Well, to diagnose one, OCT is extremely effective. It's better than IVIS, and it gives you, you know, more of a, of a histologic look at the vessel wall in terms of resolution. And as we talk about calcification, not only can we look at the arc and the length, but we can look at thickness, area, volume, and all those things may be meaningful in terms of choosing therapy. So the imaging got better, but still not enough to be accepted. So then we generated use, um, use case evidence. Well, maybe that'll make a difference. We'll do a lot of clinical trials. All right, well, this is a meta-analysis of eight randomized trials of IVIS versus angio-guided DES implantation. And you can see there's a dramatic difference in composite endpoints and individual endpoints, but people tended not to pay much attention to this. Then we did a network meta-analysis of 31 studies, 18,000 patients looking at PCI with bare metal stents, drug eluding stents, angiography, IVIS, OCT, and clearly there was a very strong evidence that either IVIS or OCT improves clinical outcomes, but it didn't move the needle in terms of being able to become incorporated or integrated into procedures. So then we added guide wire-based physiology. Now that started a while ago. We began to get data with trials like the FAME trial showing that this was an important adjunct to be able to make correct decisions. Then we made um, physiology a little easier with resting indices as shown here in large clinical trials with defined flare uh, and with IFR sweetheart. And then we even compared physiology with imaging and showed that there was not much difference between the two. But the quest to achieve more scientific PCI by integrating intravascular imaging and or physiology into routine clinical practice has truly been an unrealized goal. So now we're trying to simplify physiology using angiography, first CT angiography and then contrast angiography. 
So you're all familiar with FFRCT, and I think these are very important developments, but this is outside of the cath lab. This is not so much inside of the cath lab. And of course, most recently, we've been looking at things like CathWorks, which is a wireless artificial intelligence powered FFR angio system, which is gonna be described in great length, which is why I'm not gonna spend much time on this right now. I will tell you it's not the only way to do um, angio FFR. So um, a QFR is another approach to being able to acquire similar data from an angiogram, and that's also been subjected, subjected to a large clinical trial in China, the FAVOR-3 trial, presented at TCT last year and published in The Lancet. It's an almost 4,000 patient clinical trial demonstrating a 34% reduction in a very robust primary endpoint at a year. So there already is data suggesting that clinical outcomes are meaningfully impacted by angio-FFR. So why does FFR angio have the potential to radically simplify, or what some people say, democratize the goal to achieve more scientific PCI? Well, it combines angiography and physiologic lesion and vessel assessments without wires or drugs. It integrates very seamlessly into a routine workflow and it satisfies the triple need to achieve procedural planning, interprocedural guidance, and final optimization. So I guess Steve Jobs had it right. We need to make things simpler and simpler so that we can begin to apply them more regularly in what we do. And I think that's what FFR Angio attempts to do. It facilitates anatomic and physiologic assessments without the need for guide wires or adenosine, employing standard contrast angiography, and that makes a huge difference. So we're going to explore in the next 45 minutes with multiple lectures more about the technology, more about the science, the things we know and don't know, and how we're beginning to integrate this into current modern PCI and do it in a way that would allow us to achieve that final goal of being able to make angioplasty consistently more scientific. Thank you. So I think we're going to go on with our next speaker, uh, and then we'll do our best to have questions after each speaker. Um, and we're going to start with Rand Karnowski, and Rand is going to talk about FFR Angio from concept to reality. Thank you very much, Marty. Uh, dear audience, you, um, I'm really delighted to be here. These are my conflict of interest. I'm the co-founder of CatWorks with Ifat and Guy Lavi, and you, you can't even imagine what's going on in my mind when I attend this session, but I'm not going to be nostalgic. This is not the reason why I was invited here. So let me take you straight to the cat lab a month ago when I treated the 76-year-old lady with dyspnea angina equivalent, and she had uh, somewhat inconclusive spec imaging the interpretation was between apical ischemia and attenuation artifact. She had comorbidities, and after a long period of trying to stabilize her with medical treatment, the referring cardiologist called us and told that she, he wants us to perform a catheterization, a cath. So this is the uh, catheterization, the angiogram. So you see approximately LAD stenosis of moderate severity. You see it in the various projections. And we have decided to go ahead with uh, the analysis. So this is the FFR angio analysis, which starts by uh, delineation of uh, the coronary contours. You see here the QCA. And after less than uh, three minutes, this is what we get. So this is color-coded uh, of uh, the coronary arteries. You see here the orange with uh, LAD depicted with FFR angio of 0.75. And we went uh, straight ahead based on this analysis to perform coronary stenting. This is the stenting of the LAD. You see it in the different projections. And we also perform post-treatment FFR angio analysis. And the post-FFR uh, was 0.97. This is the way we practice nowadays in our medical center. 
So let me take you more than 10 years ago, and the question where did we, the idea of FFR Anjo come, came from, and uh, it was very clear to me to, for many years that there was an unmet need in coronary physiology assessment. And I team up with uh, computer engineers, with image processing experts, and we formed a group uh, with a clear vision and goals to replace the wire-based FFR by an integrated wireless FFR angio technique to provide a reliable tool for functional coronary lesion assessment to expand physiology assessment towards all commerce coronary artery disease uh, lesions uh, and uh, also, we were very much aware of the fact that there is a global underutilization of invasive FFR worldwide with less than 5% adoption rate in most cat labs around the world. So at the beginning, we created uh, a bench, an in vitro model with uh, simulation of flow, we were able to use high definition particle tracing to evaluate downstream flow and pressure regimes across stenotic lesions in vitro. We made a lot of calculations. We tried to improve our models. And the real breakthrough came out when we started to use the LAMP model. This was a solution uh, to allow us to evaluate ratio of flow rates for stenotic versus healthy coronary trees. The contribution of each narrowing to the total flow resistance was calculated as in electrical circuit, taking into account the inlet and outlet boundary condition of coronary vessel. The inlet is a mean uh, arterial pressure. The outlet is the myocardial resistance. And then we also created simulation using three re reconstruction of phantoms and printed coronary arteries. So we convert from angiogram uh, into 3D into a flow uh, model and we got uh, consistent in vitro results. So by January 29th, 2012, we were ready for the first case. It was a 44 year old lady with chest pain and pathologic cardiac CT. We took her to the lab. We did the invasive uh, F uh, FFR evaluation. We got an FFR of 0 0.85 on average. And then we uh, took the uh, study to the computer lab. First, we got the 3D vessel reconstruction. This is the case, and this was the first 3D reconstruction. And then, after a week period, we got the non-invasive FFR, which was 0 0.89, compared to 0 0.85, which was the invasive. And we thought it was not so bad. And then we asked, OK, what's now? It was very clear to us that we cannot wait one week in the cat lab. So we needed an online system without losing the precision, and it took us about a year to condense the evaluation or the analysis from a week to a matter of several minutes. So the system that we're using right now and for the last six to seven years is derived from the optimal 2D angiography converted into the 3D model reconstruction with the stenosis assessment and the hemodynamic evaluation color-coded based on the resistance mapping with uh, uh, the flow rate uh, ratio between the stenotic vessel and the uh, presumed normal vessel. The FFR angio is computed as the ratio between the calculated flow rate in the stenosed artery and the estimated flow rate in the same artery in the absence of stenosis using the lump element model of resistance to flow. So by now, we have a wire-free system, eliminating risk or cost or pressure wires. There is no need for adenosine or other hyperemic agents. 
we provide a comprehensive multivessel color-coded physiology assessment in a single analysis. It quickly confirms the completeness of revascularization post-PCI, and it makes the physiology practical and easy for use during most cases in the cat lab. We have had a very extensive and robust series of studies, investigation, and peer review publications starting from our JAK paper in 2016, extending for, uh, up to the pivotal study, which was a fast FFR that was presented in TCT four years ago and published at the beginning of 2019. And the pooled analysis that we published two years ago in JAK intervention. This was a study that included 588 patients, 700 lesions, about one third of the lesions were in the gray zone of FFR between 0.75 and 85, which was the problematic zone. 40% had complex feature, and we found that compared to wire-based FFR, we had 91% sensitivity, 94% specificity, and diagnostic accuracy of 93%. We had excellent correlation by the uh, regression analysis and blind, by the blunt admin analysis in this meta, in this uh, pooled analysis. And we also conducted an outcome study that compared the outcome of some 500 patients that had either deferred uh, intervention or PCI based on FFR angiography. So for patients that underwent PCI, the MACE rate by one year was 4.1%, and for those that had deferred without uh, medical, just for medical treatment, it was 2.5%. So FFR angiogram became a clinical reality in our catheterization laboratory and in multiple uh, cat labs around the world, in the US, in Japan, and some cat labs in Europe. And I would like to show you some quick cases. This is a patient with a distal RCS stenosis with angina, unstable angina. You see the color-coded FFR angio, which is 0.68 before intervention. And after PCI, we were able to demonstrate the FFR angio to become 0.88. This is very intuitive, easy to use, few minutes in the lab, and very much integrated into the workflow of our lab. This is a mid-LAD lesion in a 62-year-old lady with unstable angina. You see the mid-stenosis of 60%. You see the color-coded uh, uh, angiogram with the 3D reconstruction, and the FFR angio of 0.68, compared to 0.72 with the invasive FFR. This is another case when we could predict upfront and make a simulation of the procedure even before touching the patient and having either one stent or two stent implantation, making the calculation of the post FFR, so the pre was 0.73, the virtual post was 0.96, and the true post was 0.98. So in summary, the FFR angio system provides an interactive 3D model of the coronary tree color-coded by FFR angio values. The technology calculates single vessel and multi-vessel FFR angio in real time before and after PCI. FFR angio consistently demonstrates excellent diagnostic performance compared to the traditional FFR wires with strong results across a wide spectrum of patients and lesion sac groups. It reduced variability in the cat lab, and I think it also enhanced the concept of value-based medicine in the cat lab. FFR angio-guided treatment provides excellent one-year outcome for PCI and deferred lesions and patients, and the FFR angio has become a clinical routine which is fully integrated into the workflow of diagnostic angiography and coronary intervention. I would like to invite you to watch our FFR angio-guided case in the coronary theater soon after this session. Thank you very much.
Rand, that was really excellent. Uh, it, it, you know, it really gives me a, you know, a very clear picture of the technology. So, so uh, at first, we do have microphones, so any questions we want to invite you to ask. Um, and and uh, this is for you, Rand, and also for the panel. So um, this almost looks to be too good to be true, okay? I mean, you know, you get a 3D angiogram, you get all this quantitative stuff, you get physiology, it's not just a single vessel, you don't need wires, drugs, you get a whole coronary tree. There have to be still some unanswered questions. So, you know, let me ask some of the hard questions. So this is based upon a differential in flow ratio between normal or presumed normal and abnormal. You know, one of the problems with nuclear medicine is if you have balanced ischemia, you don't have that differential. So if you've got diffuse disease, is it more difficult to demonstrate a difference in the lesion because the flow ratio comparison is not truly legitimate? The answer is no, there is no difficulty. And if we had the time, I could show you dozens and dozens of cases with multiple lesions in the same vessel and uh, we actually can map the physiology at every uh, point of the vessel, and it's very different compared to the balance ischemia of nuclear cardiology because this is a full vessel analysis. So by the fact that we make uh, this vessel by vessel analysis, one vessel is not uh, dependent on the results of the other vessel. It's true in the left coronary, system as well as in the right coronary system. I must tell you, Marty, that your question is excellent, highly legitimate, and this was the reason that it took us uh, more than 10 years. I mean, Catworth was founded in 2013 after an extensive research, academic research that we did uh, two and a half, almost three years beforehand, and many people did not believe that we can do what we claim to do by then. And we had to prove that again and again in series of investigation and uh, relatively large clinical trials. And we showed very, very consistent results. I can tell you that in our cat lab, for the last three years, we don't use wires anymore. So I, I, I'm not here to preach. I just uh, would say that, f that, you know, you should try it for yourself and see the results. And you would be convinced, I'm pretty sure about that. How about specific anatomic subsets? So we're talking tandem lesions, osteal branch vessels, flow is different in vein grafts, um, uh, in STEMI with multivessel disease, the non-culprit lesion. Are those areas that need further investigation? Are you pretty confident that the algorithm works pretty much for all lesion subsets? So we, we have to look at the inclusion and exclusion in our trials. We, don't, we did not include osteal lesions. Uh, we uh, take into account bifurcation points, unless it is, again, osteal, but bifurcation points, uh, the system tracks very well, so we don't have problem with that. Uh, in terms of non-culprit lesion in STEMI, uh, you almost read our mind because this is one of the next endeavor that we would like to do and to confirm that. We have anecdotal cases to show it, but not systematically. So I would not say that it encompasses 100% of the lesion, but certainly the vast majority of the lesion encountered in the cat lab. Okay, that's great. Well, I have so many more questions, but we're going to go on to our next speaker. And we'll have time for more questions, and these will accumulate. So thank you, Raul Sharma, for joining us. Um, Raul and his team at Stanford will be doing cases t um, on Monday. Um, and you may see a CathWorks case, but Raul will tell us. Uh, and he's going to talk about how FFR Angio is changing the game. Thank you, Marty. And just to clarify, the live cases are tomorrow morning, not Monday. I don't want you to miss them. So. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, thank you for the opportunity to be here. And as Marty did say, I'll be talking about how FFR Angio is changing decision making in the lab and illustrating that through a case that I did quite recently at Stanford. But I also want to spend some time in the next 15 minutes doing a little bit of a deeper dive as a nice segue from the platform that Ron just left us with 
and talking about how artificial intelligence, while almost a ubiquitous term now at scientific meetings, is actually utilised by the FFR NGO software to yield the results that, that were seen. These are my disclosures. And so, as I just mentioned, artificial intelligence is not new, and it's a term that's thrown around quite commonly, but I think there's a limited understanding of what artificial intelligence truly encompasses and the different subsets of artificial intelligence. And so artificial intelligence is really a description of any technique that enables computers to mimic human behavior. And that's quite a difficult feat. Machine learning is a subset within artificial intelligence where they use AI techniques that give computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed to do so. The data's coming in, the computer is slowly in an iterative fashion learning. Deep learning or using neural networks is another layer within machine learning again. It's a subset of machine learning which uses computation of these multi-layer neural networks feasible and allows you to do much more complicated analysis and we'll see how over time the software has evolved significantly as the AI too has evolved using machine learning. So this is a, a graph that just shows you the simplified AI landscape. And there are different examples here on the left or the y-axis. You can see the mass adoption or application of these technologies. And along the bottom there, the degree of increasing sophistication. And there are different technologies that you may be familiar with. The autopilot by Tesla, for example, highly sophisticated, still not widely adopted, still some limitations. We've got personal assistants that a lot of us are familiar with and might actually be the bane of our existence at times, like Siri and Alexa where the sophistication is not quite as advanced as an auto-driving car, but certainly the adoption application and ease of use is much greater. And I think this is sort of somewhat of a guesstimate. Where FFR Angio fits in is that it's highly sophisticated, but for two reasons. First of all, the general adoption and utilization of physiology, but also the acceptance and utilization of this novel AI approach to physiology is a reason that the adoption or application is still not as great as some of these other technologies. So how does AI work? So this is an example of training an AI engine to recognize dogs. And this AI engine is trained to differentiate between dogs and cars, and it uses features extractions. So looking at things like texture, color, shape, and facial features, and you think, well, that's pretty easy. A neural network, I mean, you can do that with the naked eye. Your prediction dog versus not a dog is fairly simple. And you create this loss function on or off. And that's a pretty simple way of doing it, but you can do it much faster than humans can do with a large volume of data. But now, let's take it to another level. <laughs> to the more discerning eye, they're not all dogs. Okay? And so suddenly it's not so easy anymore. And so an AI algorithm that is simplistic in its form and doesn't continue to iterate and evolve, and without the use of deep neural networks, will no longer be able to differentiate between some of the subtleties. And this is where machine learning is critically important. So let's bring this back to the relevance of a case. So this is a patient, a 71-year-old male with the history of coronary artery disease, had a STEMI in 2006 and had stents placed to the LAD. Has an ischemic cardiomyopathy, sick sinus syndrome, diabetes, had a CT scan showing diverticulitis, and a left ventricular pseudoaneurysm. Was seen by our cardiac surgeons and was referred for cardiac surgery. In the setting of evaluation for cardiac surgery, the surgeons referred the patient to me for a preoperative angiogram. You can see that the patient had an echocardiogram, which demonstrated the pseudoaneurysm that we saw on the CT. The prior angiogram at the time of STEMI showed that stents were placed. And a perfusion scan, interestingly, from last year showed no evidence of pharmacological induced ischemia. So we went ahead and performed the diagnostic angiogram. You can see there uh, the three views of the LAD laid out quite nicely there. And you can see that there is evidence of instant restenosis and that there is some overlap and perhaps not complete a pacification of the vessels, but you do get the sense that there is at least a moderate, if not worse, lesion in that uh, LAD. And I'll say at this point that one of the many benefits of note, and perhaps an ancillary benefit of using the CathWorks FFR angio system, is that it does rely on the caveat of having good quality angiography. You need the appropriate filling of the vessel, the appropriate frames, no panning. And so to me, one of the benefits has been improving the quality of diagnostic angiography that goes on in the cath lab. And I see Mort Kern in the audience, and I know he's a big proponent of quality angiography. And so this was the angiogram of the left side. And then we moved on to the angiogram of the right side. You can see there's also a moderate lesion, a mild to moderate lesion in that mid-right coronary artery there. 
And so we went ahead and is our custom to, I've moved away from doing wire-based FFR much like Brown. I do all of my physiological assessments now using wireless FFR, a simple setup with the console in all of the cath labs in which we perform most of our coronary angiography. And so we ran the assessment and I won't go through how it works, Rand has already shown you that. But here the algorithm on your home screen is able to select the views. Now I will say that in the early iterations of the software, a lot more manual intervention was required. Over time, as the software has evolved and the technology has evolved, the need for human interaction and involvement has been much less. There's a lot more automation now with the software. The caveat to that and the discussion about osteal lesions was that sometimes in osteal lesions, the ability of the software to discriminate the borders of the osteum are a little bit limited, and those are the situations I've noticed of late where some manual interventions are required. Having said that, in this case, the, al the algorithm, the software, was able to identify the appropriate images related to the different views. We selected the vessel of interest, in this case the LAD, and entered the mean arterial pressure, which, as Ryan had mentioned, correlates with that inflow pressure or the inflow. And then there's color coding of the angiogram quality in terms of selecting what is the best angiogram of the pictures that are being taken to optimize assessment by the platform. Any non-left coronary angiograms are automatically filtered out by the AI engine. It's able to recognize left-sided versus non-left-sided. Three angiograms are selected, again, coming back to the importance of orthogonal views of the coronary tree. And sometimes we get a little bit lazy, but it's important in this case that we don't be lazy because there'll be an incomplete data set and you won't be able to perform the analysis to the ability that the program otherwise can. So these are all 30 degrees apart. We get good orthogonal views of the left system. We select the three best views. And then there's dynamic feedback for angio selection. So once you've selected the appropriate image, the other image will now be negated. The AI engine then recommends an optimal image frame, correlating with adequate filling by which the assessment can be made. What is an optimal frame? The AI decrees an optimal frame is one that's an end diastole with good, good contrast opacification where you can see the full tree. And you can see that third panel on the left represents an optimal frame. And so we mark the first lesion to analyze, in this case, that mid-LAD instant restenosis. We review the vessel auto detection QCA, and this is where the human element comes in to make sure that this is correct. The borders have been identified correctly. And for the most part, I will say this is being done a lot better with the new iteration of the software. The vessel is then segmented and classified per pixel as being vessel or not vessel. And then the system uses that neural network that I mentioned to classify the DICOMs, detect what's a vessel, and then label and identify each vessel using that resistance flow model that was mentioned. And so using deep learning, the system identifies and labels each of those epicardial vessels. And if the wrong vessel is selected by chance, by mistake, the system can alert the user to fix the mistake. So in this, in this example, the lesion is expected to be assigned to the left circumflex but has been incorrectly assigned to the LAD, and the system detects that. So here is our patient with the left FFR angioanalysis results, so strongly positive there in that mid-LAD, in that area of instant restenosis. There's the measuring tool. If we had decided to go forward with percutaneous coronary intervention, this would provide a benefit in being able to measure the length of the lesion and help select stent sizing in terms of length of the stent and also diameter of the vessel. There's a pullback curve with FFR co-registration to look for the region of maximal ischemia, and this can also be helpful in terms of guiding the percutaneous procedure. This was the assessment of that right coronary angioanalysis. It was a moderate lesion, and again, with the ease of use and the ability to do this with really very little additional time, and obviously without the need to put a guide, a wire, and give adenosine to another vessel, we are able to provide a complete physiological assessment of that patient's coronary tree for the surgeons, and in this case, that moderate lesion in the mid-RCA was deemed to be non-significant physiologically. And so, as is my routine practice, I communicate with the referring surgeon immediately. I let them know that the patient has a significant lesion in the mid-LAD and may need a graft, and the lesion in the mid-RCA is of no significance. And so that patient went on to have repair of that aneurysm and a single vessel bypass to the LAD. Now, we mentioned multi-vessel disease. And this is a study from Japan showing the diagnostic performance of the angio-FFR system in multivessel disease. So this, of note, did use a previous older version that had much less AI sophistication than the current version. Nevertheless, it still had an excellent diagnostic performance. There was 92% sensitivity. 
similar specificity and similar diagnostic accuracy. Importantly, as we're all busy in the lab and we don't want this to interrupt our workflow, the per vessel time for FFR angio was just over four minutes compared to almost double with a traditional wire-based approach. That translated to a per patient time of about seven minutes versus 15 minutes. And importantly, from a clinical perspective, the FFR angio reclassified the number of vessels with a significant stenosis compared to angiography alone, as you can see in that panel on the right. So in summary, FFR angio eliminates the need for pressure wires in adenosine. It improves the efficiency of the workflow. The system can be very easily integrated into routine clinical practice in cath labs around the country. Our experience, both in a, in a large data set but also at Stanford, has shown a high concordance between FFR angio and traditional wire-based methods. There's a wide patient and lesion applicability. And finally, the use of AI, which is constantly evolving, has driven comprehensive information and reduced procedure time to make FFR angio, at least in our institution, the preferred method over wire-based FFR. Thank you. <clears throat> Raul, that was really excellent. Um, you know, watching you go through a case was very, very instructive, but you had the sense that there were more steps than what would take seven minutes during the course of the case. Is it because you're so experienced, or the Japanese were so experienced, for a new user, is there more um, um, uh, uh, user interface required or getting used to this, or is this something that is reasonably intuitive and it really can be integrated into casework? I think that's an excellent practical question. Early in the experience, I will say there was a lot more human interaction required, and correspondingly, there was a greater learning curve. I would say with the first iteration of the software, it would take anywhere from five to 10 cases, uh, depending on how technologically adept you were, to really get a handle on the system. I would say with the current iteration, it's less than five cases, and I don't know what the others feel, but I think after three to five cases, you have a good feel. As I mentioned, the degree of automation by the software is exponentially greater than the prior versions of the software. And so a lot of that that's being done is being done by the software, and you're really just checking through as you're going, going through those screens to make sure that everything's identified. The only rare manipulation, as I mentioned, is with osteal lesions and contours where perhaps there's an overlap of some vessels and side branches. Other than that, most of the time I'm not really interfering and it's just clicking through each of those steps to get the final result. Well, we're going to move on to our last talk and hopefully we'll have more time to address some of these interesting questions. So Amir Khaki is joining us. He's also had a f uh, an extensive in-lab experience with FFR Angio and he'll talk about how to practically integrate this in today's cath lab. Yeah, so thank you for having me. I'm going to talk about the practical application of this technology. It's interesting as I was listening to uh, Dr. Uh, Leon's uh, initial uh, presentation when he uh, invoked uh, Dr. Uh, Andreas Grunzik. I was looking at the dates, and uh, when he did his first angioplasty, I was three months old. So I think uh, if uh, God bless his soul, if he was here, I think he'd be proud of us. We've come a long way. So these are my disclosures. And I'm going to talk about the practical setup uh, of using FFR. So we did our first case. It's almost been a year ago. And I'll talk about our experience. We found that it, found it to be a very efficient uh, technology that's really Im improved our workflow, particularly if you're in a high volume lab where you have uh, multiple operators and efficiency is critically important. Uh, in our lab, it's ready to go for every case. It's automated. We have a very nice feature that you should consider if you're going to get this technology, the auto push which uh, Dr. Lon, who's in our audience, our chief, when he started uh, doing his first case, he was quite impressed because he said he shot the right coronary artery first, and by the time he finished the angiograms of the left coronary artery, he had the data for the right. So I think that that goes to say, uh, show how efficient the technology is, particularly with that feature. So when, with the images shortly thereafter, they're pre-processed and you have that data. It could also be directly uh, projected from the boom, so you could see if it's the, your technician or your nurse, whoever is doing the analysis, as Rahul said, the technology has been so, so automated that really as the operator, you really just want to supervise to make sure that uh, if there's any manual input that it's done properly. The good thing is rarely that we have to adjust it. It has a very small footprint in the lab, and you can see kind of this is a console for those of us that have do a lot of uh, imaging, IVIS SR and OCT, uh, we're familiar with these consoles, or you could get an integrated system. 
Here's kind of the, the, the report that we that produced from these cases. This is a wonderful communication cool, tool that's actually easy enough uh, for, to send to your referring physicians, but also for the patients who are interested. And you see the data, uh, which is relevant. You see the angiogram pre and post. You see the post physiology uh, when we do that. And uh, you could see the pullback analysis here. So at our institution, we've adopted this uh, and gone away from a wireless, but what we've also done is we've become very adept at using uh, the post-PCI because we have the, uh, the data, and I'll tell you uh, why we should consider it. So this is, I'm gonna share with you two practical cases that we did recently. This is a 78-year-old uh, physician. He lived in Virginia. He had a friend who lived in Detroit, and he came uh, to us for a second opinion. His complaint was that he had exertional dyspnea. He had a workup in Virginia. He had a negative stress test. He had a normal echocardiogram, and you could see he has the potpourri of risk factors that you would uh, suspect with someone with coronary disease, but all his risk factors were controlled and modified. Uh, he came to see me in the office, and we did an echo. He had some very subtle hypokinesis in the anterior wall, and the plan was to take him to the cath lab given his incessant symptoms. So here's the angiogram. So I think uh, it's pretty clear that he has a critical lesion in the proximal LAD. He has an intermediate lesion in the circ that you could see in the mid-body of the circ. And this, so we did the FFR angio, and on the circumflex, you could see the circumflex was physiologically non significant. So that helps us. What about the right coronary artery? Again, very similar to the angiogram that Rahul showed, you could see uh, there's an intermediate lesion in the right coronary artery there at the right atrial branch. I think most people would call it intermediate. So we, we were there, so we did an FFR angio, and you could see it was 0.9. So clinically insignificant, the circ and the right, so very helpful. And here's the LAD which you could make the case probably doesn't need much evaluation, but we did. And you could see this was a very severe lesion, but I think it's important to do this to get an, a baseline uh, angio FFR so that you could uh, compare it to your post. Now, we at our lab do a lot of co-registration imaging, and you could see from here, uh, we use the, the imaging to assess plaque morphology for vessel prep, we use imaging for a re distal reference vessel sizing so we could predict the right stent. And also we do a lot of post imaging to make sure that mechanically we have the most optimal result as possible. So here you can see it's a very a tight lesion, comes back to the osteo LAD. You can see uh, there's a thin kite fibro atheroma and you, atheroma, and you can also see there's calcium that was quantified to be 240 degrees. As a result of this, and you can see this on the IVIS, uh, the plan was to use plaque, plaque modification. In this particular case, we chose to use IVL, given the high degree and uh, heavy arc of calcium. So the vessel was prepped using a lithotripsy, and we put in the stent, and we did post-imaging on the stent, and you could see that we have good stent expansion and good apposition of the stent on the pullback. We also have uh, quantitative uh, analysis here. Here's the, the pullback. And here's our pre and our post. So the patient's uh, minimal lumen area was 2.2 at the uh, tightest spot. And you can see post PCI, the minimal lumen area was 5.3. And here you can see the post angiograms. We did. And here is the LAD post FFR angio analysis. So if you remember, once it goes below 0.5, it doesn't measure it any further, but the post is 0.96. So what we learned from this case was that uh, physiology really guided our decision, so we deferred the treatment of the circ in the right uh, with certainty, so there was a very objective data. The IVIS really helped us uh, prepare the lesion for the PCI. We chose our plaque modification technology based on that. The post-IVIS uh, reassured us that we had the best optimal result for this patient to try to ensure him the most durable outcome. And the FFR angio, we used uh, the threshold to look at this to confirm that the physiologic result was consistent with what we saw anatomically. So when you talk about what is the prognostic value, should we be doing post-physiologic assessments on PCI patients? And that's something uh, that has been addressed in manuscripts showing reduction in outcomes if we use this. So what is the best way to, to physiologically uh, evaluate if your PCI uh, was optimal? So one way in this particular manuscript is just look at the actual absolute FFR number. In our case, uh, it was above, uh, it was above 0.95. There's another way to evaluate that's been published and described is what is the percent gain. So if you're, for example, your FFR was 0.7, 
and you get it up to 0.91, you take that percentage. And in this particular manuscript, the ideal gain to reduce outcomes was greater than 15% from the index procedure. And another way, which we did in this particular case as well, is look at the gradient across the stent. And all three of these, uh, tech, all the, all three of these have been described in the literature. Obviously, there's a lot more work to do, but it is becoming a common practice at our institution. So we had the pleasure um, and the honor earlier this, this year in February to do a live case. And this was a high-risk case that required mechanical support. And I want to go through this case, and uh, I want you to hear some of the comments from, from a very distinguished, illustrious panel that were guiding us through the procedure. So this is a 59-year-old gentleman with a history of dyslipidemia. He's insulin-dependent diabetic who came to the institution with substernal chest pain. He had a Canadian class three angina, and he had ST elevation and fear wall. Came to the cath lab emergently, and you could see on the left side, he had critical left main disease that was confirmed on IVIS, and the infarcolated artery was the right coronary artery. So what do you do in a case like this? So the, the operator on call, I thought was, it was a reasonable decision, decided to do angioplasty to the right coronary artery in no stenting and refer the patient for surgery. So a stent was deferred given the left main in hopes that the patient would go to surgery. So this was done, the patient had flow established, resolution of symptoms, EKG improved. He goes to the unit in anticipation for cardiac surgery and we could debate that if that's an appropriate strategy or not. What happened to him uh, post uh, angioplasty alone, he had non-sustained VT in the unit, became electrically unstable, required a transvenous pacemaker. His EF was severely reduced uh, at presentation. Now he had reduced RV uh, function, can, you know, probably now he has R RV infarct. Uh, and post-procedure day one, the patient has dynamic EKG changes and could not wait for surgery, so he was brought to the cath lab. And what you see, is that he had abrupt closure or thrombosis of the right coronary artery, and at this point, the hand was forced and PCI was done to the right coronary artery. So uh, we did this on mechanical support, did this live, like and the context of this Dr. discussion Tom, was we the treated the left main, there was an yeah, LAD yeah. lesion, wow. Look at this. and should Don't we treat it? Zero point nine. I did not expect. And we started out, if, 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 if you remember, we started out 0.73. You know, this is a, is a very good uh, example how to use FFR to guide the procedure because I would have done drug coated balloon distally and it would have been a mistake because I would have taken the chance of dissecting, etc., etc. This is but look at it now. FFR Maybe that's the idea. You don't need. You may be correct. You don't need. Yeah, that's a good idea. Antonio, you never make mistakes. <laughs> I like it. I like it. you. you Amir, Amir and all, this looks like it's a good idea. We yeah. have so the point of that slide was we fixed the left main. There was a residual mid-LAD lesion, and the debate with the panelists is should we treat the mid-LAD lesion. After we did the FFR angio, it was not clinically significant. We deferred it, it's potentially you know, saving the patient an unnecessary procedure and the, the MACE events that, that come with that. So. That's been our experience. I hope that's uh, useful and practical. And again, thank you for having me. Yeah, so uh, I think we're gonna interrupt the session. I can assure you that there's gonna be a lot more that we'll discuss with this technology and a lot more data that you'll um, uh, be um, seeing over the course of time. Uh, but this was really in, uh, an opportunity to introduce something that's a little bit different that has now been brought into clinical environments that is FDA approved and has the, the potential of allowing us to do angioplasty in a different way. So I want to thank the speakers. I want to again point out that we did a, a wonderful pre-recorded case from Rabin Medical Center that will be shown in about 30 minutes in the coronary theater if you're interested. There's going to be the live case from Stanford tomorrow, I got that wrong, and then Dwayne Pinto is going to be doing live cases uh, from the BI on Monday. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Hey, Rand, great job. Thank you.